Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tara Brabazon and I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University. And I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome you here this evening. Are you excited? Yes. Are you seriously excited? It is my incredible pleasure also to commence with an acknowledgement of country, acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet today, elders past and present and any Indigenous colleagues with us today. It's so appropriate, I think, to summon Indigenous history and histories, traditions, futures and legacies, because I'm welcoming you to something very, very special, the first lecture in our Flinders University research series, Brave. The title of this lecture series, I think, acknowledges the extraordinary, the passionate and the powerful research that's being undertaken at Flinders University right now, and indeed every single day. But this title also arches back to our origins. Flinders University was formed, founded in 1966, a great year for music, can I say? By memory, the Beatles' Rubber Soul album, tremendous year. <laughs> and our university, of course, took its name from Captain Matthew Flinders, the first person to circumnavigate man mainland Australia. So he carried that quest for knowledge, that desire to discover, to understand the unknown. And yes, be brave. Exploration and bravery, discovery and courage. If a university has a vision that could transform this planet right now, then Matthew Flinder's legacy grants us the know-how, the vision, the style and the strategy. The university created in Matthew Flinders' name is a place of exploration, courage, and, I'm proud of this, bravery. Our ambitions are vast. We want to make a difference. We want to change lives, and we want to change the world. Flinders' first Vice-Chancellor, Professor Peter Carmel, captured this vision best for Flinders. And when I decided to join Flinders a couple of years ago, this phrase made my mind up to join this fine organisation. And that phrase was, we want to experiment and experiment bravely. It was a statement of vision, of inspiration, of aspiration, and our researchers are guided by this goal. Our hope, and our hope at our very best, is we engage in that pursuit of knowledge. We probe and solve the various challenges that exist on Earth now, and we are guided by that desire to make a difference. Tonight we experiment, and we experiment bravely. We enter the volatile, intricate, complex, and rather difficult sphere of bodies and body image. Do I get a ooh? <laughs> Health, fitness and sport, of course, are major industries and major economic drivers in the creative industries. In my own field of cultural studies, the two edgy interdisciplinary interventions in my fields are emerging through physical cultural studies and deviant leisure cultures. This is an edgy topic that can create incredible personal damage, or empowerment, but also complex changes in our social and our political landscape. So what you're going to hear shortly is some transformative research about body image, eating disorders, health, fitness, masculinity, femininity. We're going to raise some key questions about who we are. What is the relationship between who we are and our physicality? And what's the relationship between work and working out. It's such an incredible privilege to open our brave lecture series with a woman who embodies its title and embodies this trope. Taryn Brumfit gained prominence when she courageously intervened in public discourses about body shape. She is honest, she is clear, she is passionate in her desire to transform how women and men think about themselves and gain a consciousness of their value. Her body image movement is powerful and potent, and I recommend her website to you, body image movement, one word, dot com, and of course, her 2016 film, Embrace. 
on behalf of Flinders University and the portfolio for the Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Research, I thank Taryn for joining us today to share her insights that began with a concern for her daughter and went on to transform the lives of millions of people on Earth. She remains brave. And please join me to welcome Taryn Brumfield. Thank you. Do you know, as a speaker, sometimes you sit there listening to the speaker before you go, ooh, <laughs> she or he's pretty good, but never with the MC. Amazing. I you're amazing. <laughs> Isn't she amazing? Oh my gosh. I just want to hang out with you. <laughs> Maybe we can after. Um, thank you so much to the Flinders University for inviting me here this evening. I have to apologise, I did wake up this morning with tonsillitis and I um denied whether I would tell you, but I thought um, in case I'm not as sharp as I normally am, it's the tonsillitis, that's all. Um, but I really wanted to be here um, to hang out with some incredible people. Um, and I look to you, Professor Tigerman, because uh, Professor Tigerman was in Embrace. Um, you've all, can you just stand up? I just, go on, stand up, Professor Marika Tigerman. Do you remember her face for those of you? I've had the, the, the privilege of two years of promoting this film here in Australia and right around the world and people just adore you and, and love your honesty and, and um, thank you so much for being an embrace. So it's really tough. You're there. You're there. I'll look out to the rest of you, mere mortals. Uh, <laughs> kidding. Um, so how many of you have seen Embrace in this room? Oh, this is good. Um, the last talk that I did, there was like one person and a couple of crickets. And no, but it actually excites me when people haven't seen Embrace and they are struggling with their body. I made this film to help people. And look, I never uh, planned to do any of the things that I've done. It all started um, a few years ago when I really hated my body so much that it crippled me from being the person that I usually am. And that's quite a free, um, loving, happy person. If I take you back um, to my teens and, and my 20s, I had a relatively positive body image. And I say relatively positive because I was still that girl who dieted. Um, I still wanted her body. I still wanted to lose the last five kilos. Um, but I was still able to get on with my life. It wasn't until I had my children that everything changed for me. And I was one of these women that I just adored being pregnant, everything about it. I loved it. And there was nothing more beautiful than being in the shower and rubbing my big uh, growing bump um, with soap. It just felt so delicious. I loved being pregnant. And then, of course, after I birthed my first child, um, Oliver, I was sitting in the shower just a few moments after and I looked down at what had been this magical and beautiful bump and it was just this jelly belly mess. Um, and I haven't checked with the organisers, but there's only one, one way I can say this. I looked down and I thought, what the fuck has happened? My beautiful <laughs> belly. I'm sorry. But that's what I thought. It was hideous. Um, but I thought, you know what, I'm going to get my body back because that's what we're told to do, to get our bodies back. So I hit the netball court um, about six weeks after giving birth and I'm a really highly competitive person. I could see the ball coming down the court and I thought, this intercept is mine. And it was. I got it. Um, but... As I grabbed the ball, I felt something running down my leg and I had wet myself right there on the netball court. It's a little hard to do it in here tonight and I've been told not to move, but I'm going to because I like to break the rules. Um, I did this. Um, we coming down and I sort of... Oh, I've injured myself. I just got to... I took myself off to the bathroom, sort of like this. Um, and for every other game of netball that I played, I, I, I never played with that confidence ever again. And I just, and I also had a pad knickers, pad knickers. I had this, <laughs> I had, 
Yeah, it was like, you know, riding a horse almost on the netball court. Um, but I lost all my confidence and I, I didn't want to be intimate with my husband. I stopped going out with friends. I just hated my body so much. It took me to a really dark, dark place. You disloyal body, I hate you. And I had two more children and loved the pregnancy, hated what came after, loved the pregnancy, hated what com came after. And after I had my third child, I decided I couldn't live like this anymore. I, I couldn't live with the shame of my body and I wanted to get it fixed. So I took myself off to the cosmetic surgeon and I walked in just down here on Wakefield Street and I declared to him, my body is broken, please fix it. And he picked up my boobs like they were dirty tissues, like this. Um, um, because when you fed 4,000 meals, um, that's what happens to your breasts. For those of you who haven't had children and want to, please don't be discouraged. Um, <laughs> Um, and he grabbed my uh, belly and it was like a hot dog. It's more like a hamburger these days, but it was like a hot dog down here. And he agreed that he could just take it away and, and fix me up. And I remember walking out of that surgeon's appointment being so happy. And Matt, my husband, was with me. Um, he didn't want me to have surgery, but he was going to support me, whatever I decided. So it was all booked in. And I was so, so happy. And a couple of weeks after this appointment, I was watching my daughter, Michaela, playing in front of me and I had this epiphany. And I'd never had an epiphany before in my life. It was like a, a lightning bolt had struck from the sky and hit the ground in front of me. And I thought, how am I going to teach Michaela to love her body if I can't love my body? And if I have surgery, what will that do for the relationship that she has with her body? So um, I will say at this point, if you're sitting here and you've just had your Botox done, you're thinking, oh, awkward, um, your body, your rules, my body, my rules. So there's no room in this body image movement or discussion around body image to have judgment or shame. Um, we all do the best we can given our unique circumstances. So I cancelled the surgery, and but I was still plagued with the thought, what does it feel like to have the perfect body and how am I going to live for the next 60 years in this hideous body? So I spoke to my um, trainer at the gym and I said to her, what am I going to do? Uh, and she said, why don't you enter a bodybuilding competition? <laughs> like... I'm not doing that. Um, and before uh, I knew it, I was, I was training to enter a, a, the fitness competition of a bodybuilding competition. And in 15 weeks, I lost a lot of weight um, and I toned up and that, that, that silver bikini and those hideous shoes, I walked across um, Norwood Town Hall in front of 900 people dressed like that. Um, and my poor dad, he was in the audience and he's got silver fox hair, my dad, and I caught his eye out of 900 people. And I thought, what is dad thinking right now of his daughter, you know, doing all these moves? Um, but I trained and I got the body and I thought that I would reach the nirvana that so many women and men try to reach. I thought um, having the perfect bikini body would make me happy, and it didn't. When I stood there on stage, I thought to have this body takes too much time and sacrifice, too much obsession. Um, this is not my, my body's happy, natural state to be in. Um, hours at the gym, weighing food, weighing myself, putting food into plastic containers like that's intuitive and mindful and pretending it was great on Instagram. Look at me with my 10 meals prepared in plastic containers. Um, in the schoolyard, I would have mums come up to me and tell me when my body looked like this, how inspirational I was to have this body. They didn't even know me, half of these people. So it makes a person inspiring to have and lose weight and to have that body it was crazy. But what I also thought about standing on stage as I walked off was, my goodness, this body of mine, it's not an ornament. It's a vehicle in life. I'm here to do. I feel so disconnected in this perfect body. I feel disconnected to Matt and my children. I'm all obsessed. I just can't do this. It's not sustainable. So I went back um, to what my body is now um, and what you see in that after photograph. And 
I, I just was happy. I was really happy and content. And I was eating foods that, that made me feel good, that, that fueled me to have great energy. And I was moving my body in a way that gave me pleasure and it didn't feel like punishment anymore. It, it just, it felt so, so good. And I felt like I had won the golden ticket. And I was speaking to some girlfriends about six months um, after the competition and they were struggling with their body and they were saying, but Taryn, you've had this body and now you've got this body. How do you possibly love it? Um, And I thought the only way I could share how I loved it and was to put a photograph out on social media, which I did. Um, We see these before and after photographs, women before, (laughs) overweight, miserable. They lose weight and they miraculously miraculously become happy. No, there's so many untold stories. So I swapped mine around in the hope that it would help the friends that I'd just been speaking to. It accidentally went really viral. And um, my husband was in the room in the lounge next door. Um, He was watching 60 Minutes and I just get this, Taryn, did you just put a photograph of yourself (laughs) nude on social media? And I was like, oh, yeah, I did, but, um, and try to sort of explain myself, if you ever see Matthew Brumford, um, give that man a hug because he is such a private man and I've thrown into this really unprivate world. He deserves a hug, that man. Anyway, um, 100 million views. The media went nuts. How could a woman possibly love her body after? It was uh, even on the Qantas in-flight news. Like crazy. Um, And look, I played the game of media for about 12 months, but I soon became very frustrated that they wanted to throw me on as the, normally I bounce off these walls. So thank goodness in this setting, maybe that I have got tonsillitis, that I'm not bouncing off the walls. But they would roll me out onto set because, you know, the happy blonde, um, you know, a fluffy news story. And no, when I posted this photograph, 8,000 people contacted me who were were hurting, um, who were hating their body as, and hating their lives. This was not a fluffy four-minute TV interview piece. We needed to do so much more. I've got about two minutes. Um, so I thought I need to take control back here. And very nonchalantly one day I said, I'm just going to make a documentary because how hard could that be? Well, I spent two years with a giant cold sore on my lip because it's really hard and really stressful. Um, But I raised, uh, we raised uh, $331,000 on on Kickstarter. We set out to raise $200,000 for a 60-day campaign. We hit $200,000 on day 12, went on to raise the $331,000, had support from Ashton Kutcher and Rosie O'Donnell and Ricky Lake and you name it. Everyone flocked to this story because I think... We just, we want this to end. This, it, we're not here on earth to spend our lives at war with our body. And I think that's why so many of us are here tonight to open up these really important conversations. So for those of you who haven't seen Embrace, please do. Um, it's such an honour to be here this evening. I'm getting the, the like the hook. I'm going to get hooked off the stage in a minute. Um, but let's continue the conversation up at the panel afterwards. Thank you for listening to my story, everybody. Thank you. No, well, you're very trendy, so I'm just fitting in with you. So, if you could, please sit anywhere you would like. And could I now? How, how fantastic was that? Can I just say how fantastic was that? I feel so inspired. I think most of us are bouncing off the walls at this point. It is incredibly exciting to have you here, and you are an inspirational woman. It is, isn't it? Aren't you proud to be in Adelaide that such a person exists in this city? Remarkable. I'm now going to invite my wonderful colleagues onto the stage. Professors Marika Tigerman, who we've already met, please come up. Murray Drummond and Tracy Wade. Three professors, please come on up. And if you can sort of sit in the magic chairs and prop. I know it's very unfortunate, but then I would like to invite Marika, if you can, come in and each of our colleagues will be speaking for just three, four minutes to offer commentary and context, and then we'll be opening ourselves to questions. So get the questions ready in your mind. You may not be able to see the slides. Because of the folks, anyway, it doesn't matter. But they've got screen behind you. Okay. Um, Taron always is a very hard act to follow, so I've got that, that gig. When I started working in the area of body image in the early 1990s, it was viewed as a somewhat weird and esoteric topic. People would often ask me, 
what is it? And why would anyone be bothered studying that? Well, over time, that's obviously changed. And here we all are to discuss body image. Back then, body image was seen as trivial. But we now know it can have serious mental and physical health consequences. Back then, it was seen as an issue only for some adolescent girls. Well, now that's expanded to younger girls and to older women and to men and boys too. Back then, media in this context basically meant thin models in fashion magazines. Here at Flinders, we were the first to show that the watching of certain types of television, namely soap operas and music videos, was also associated with body image concerns, as headlined in this now rather faded advertiser billboard. I guess nothing much happened on uh, Tuesday, August 13th of 1996, <laughs> but it does illustrate that what we now take as self-evident really wasn't always so. And then came the internet, 24-7 access, and in particular social media, and it was a whole new ball game for, for body image. In that context, I thought I'd present what was the first experimental study of the effects of Fitspiration. So Fitspiration consists of images and motivational text designed to motivate people towards a healthy and happy lifestyle through the promotion of healthy eating and exercise. So what could be bad about that? Well, there are a variety of potentially concerning aspects that you can read there. But anyway, what we did, empirical, we just got a group of women to view some typical Instagram inspiration images on an iPad, and we had a control group view some travel images. When we did that, what did we find? So these are before-after measures. The before is the light purple, the um, after the dark purple. So what we saw was that there was an increase in inspiration, that the women reported that when they viewed the Fitspiration images, that increased their inspiration, and in particular, to eat healthily and to improve their fitness. But at the same time, what we found was that the Fitspiration, unlike the travel, increased negative mood and also increased body dissatisfaction. So looking at those supposedly positive images made people feel inspired, but it actually made them feel bad and feel worse about their bodies. And we also showed that that body dissatisfaction was a function of the amount of comparison that the women did, that they reported with the images. So, perspiration is not very good for your body image, basically. Okay, where are we now? We're conducting uh, a suite of studies on other aspects of Instagram, like the number of likes and uh, different kinds of captions, including body positive captions. So watch this space for those results. Thank you. Murray. Thank you. <laughs> All right, I'm on. Okay, so way back in 1997, oops, um, I did a, a PhD and it was in the social construction of masculinity in elite level sports. Interestingly, one of the things that came up was these issues around body image uh, for the men, for the elite level athletes, which I found absolutely fascinating, which then after the PhD led me down a path of doing more and more, increasingly more um, research around male body image. I'm a qualitative researcher, so the, all of my, my, my work is around interviewing, um, interviewing men, um, as, as well as a whole bunch of other things as well. But, this is what I've been doing. Can I take this off? Yes, okay, good. All right. If I can, there we go. Um, so I've been doing in-depth um, qualitative research interviews with a whole range of different men and boys and adolescents um, from a whole range of different demographics, including triathletes, bodybuilders, surf lifesavers, boys aged 13 to 17, who are both skilled and less skilled at sport and physical activity, which is an interesting point, and we can talk about that later. Eating disordered men, um, male fitness leaders, who are the ones um, with the pursuit of the great body, uh, ageing men, gay men, Asian gay men, 
HIV positive men, uh, straight university males, although this wasn't a, a necessarily a body image um, uh, research that we did. We looked at men kissing men, but there were issues of body image that, that came out of that. Elite Masters athletes, and then most recently I've been doing um, uh, interviews with uh, boys aged 5 to 13 years, and I'm actually uh, writing a book at the moment. I can talk a bit about that uh, a little bit later. One of the interesting things to come out of all of this when I asked the men about various aspects was this whole notion of muscularity. So muscularity is the key um, to link to masculinity and the work that I've been doing. So I'm going to quickly take you through a journey through time. And as I've said there, the meaning of muscles and men. Now this is a picture of Sando in the, or Sandow in the, the late uh, 1800s and he was regarded as the, the strongest man in the world and people used to come and see and flock to see him and they were really interested in his muscles and how strong he was. So even back then that was, a, that was interesting. We look here, the 1930s, this is one of the original Tarzans here. Okay, um, it's a smooth, it's a large body, it's a muscular body, but it's smooth. We move over to here, to the, in, to the 1960s, another Tarzan, who are, are iconic archetypal male figures that boys often look up to. You look here, you've got a six pack happening here, you've got hair, you've got what we call vascularity here, okay, so you've got low, low body fat which is a key, and we, again, we can talk about that later. We move to the 1970s, okay? And you might remember this. <laughs> okay, so we have, we have Jack Thompson. He was the original Cleo centerfold. Okay, so we've moved, we've moved from muscles and we've moved from, from, um, from vascularity in the 1970s, but we've, we've certainly moved to hair, hair on the face, <laughs> hair on the body. Now, that's a, a picture of um, Jack Thompson, as I said there, um, depicting um, Titian's um, Venus of Urbino. So that's him there. Okay, we move to the 1980s. And this is the hyper-muscular, hyper-masculine kind of comic book heroes. Um, and it's certainly through the 80s and, and early and to mid-90s. And you've got Arnold Schwarzenegger who, incidentally, even now when I ask young males who their, uh, their role model is in terms of um, uh, uh, physicality, it often comes back with Arnold Schwarzenegger and many have seen the movie Pumping Iron and he was the founder of, of bodybuilding uh, effectively in, in contemporary society. And this is Dolph Lundgren, um, he was Conan the Barbarian. So as you can see there, muscular, very bodybuilding kind of physiques, um, you'll also notice that they are hairless, okay, which is the antithesis of what was going on in the 70s. Okay, then we move to the, the 2000s and this is what we have. We have this kind of homogenous kind of um, physique. Um, I am very good friends with, the, um, with a, a guy in Australia who was on the, um, the original um, panel to, to, to choose the, um, uh, the physique that went on the Australian, the first original Men's Health magazine and he had to be, he had to look um, straight enough that girls would um, desire him, but he also had to look gay enough that gay guys had to desire him as well, which was really interesting. So you've got this kind of homogenous physique going on here. This is the work that I'm currently doing with the boys. And again, now I'm going to quickly show you, because I've only got a couple of, well, one, one minute to go, I think, I hope. Um, I asked the boys, these five-year-old boys, to draw me a picture of a man, not a muscular man, just a man. And the majority of the young males, this, this is the type of thing that they, they draw, okay? Happy, but with muscles. Again, <laughs> that's muscles. Yep. Again, all of these ripples are muscles. And this guy's very happy, as you can see. You've got smiley faces all around, which is good. Okay. Yes, and there was a lots of laughter in this one too because he's in the shower and he's, he's got his penis showing. So he thought that was very good. But again, but again, muscles. So that, that's, a, that's a key, okay? So that's it for me. And I'm happy to take... Okay, so um, my journey into this area was actually um, as a clinical psychologist. That's what I did initially in my training. 
and I started working with people in various settings who had eating disorders. And when I was working in that sort of area, I decided that um, I would like to find out more about it. I'd like to go back and do a PhD and find out a bit more about what caused eating disorders because these are very severe and very destructive disorders that, um, that literally pull apart people's lives and their ability to live. And I think you, you've got a bit of a flavour of that from what's been said already tonight. So I did uh, go on to complete the PhD and I actually did that at Flinders, did some postdoctoral work and um, what I wanted to do was to, to really understand exactly what was causing eating disorders and I wanted to adopt a bench to bedside sort of approach. So from the genetics through to the actual disorder so that we could figure out what are the best targets to actually focus on so we can help prevent these disorders and treat them much more quickly. And uh, it's been a great pleasure of mine to be involved very much with setting up the statewide eating disorder service here in South Australia. I'm the academic lead and I'm on the management committee um, in order to try to improve the services that we have in this state. So the genetic research, we've actually, I've been writing about the involvement of genes in eating disorders for about 25 years now. But it's only actually last year that we've got to the point of starting to identify specific genetic loci. And there are thousands of genetic loci that are going to increase risk for disordered eating. And we've just started to identify a few. And what's interesting out of this research is that it suggests that anorexia nervosa genetically is related to things like obsessive compulsive disorder and schizophrenia, but it's also related to metabolic disorders that involve insulin and perhaps macrobiota in the gut. So it's already starting to introduce new ideas about possible ways of intervening. I'm also interested in gene environment interactions and that's basically asking the question, which environment is the most toxic for those who are genetically susceptible to developing eating disorders? And one of the environments that our research suggests is peer teasing about appearance. Really toxic and um, can be a major trigger for those who are already genetically vulnerable. So that really points to some ideas already about how to improve our treatments. Um, the other thing that, that worries me as a clinician is that we actually have very few effective treatments. Uh, we have some stuff which helps some people, but not everybody, and we have to do better. So we know that uh, we have to certainly do better with anorexia nervosa for adults, and we also have to improve outcomes for people with bulimia nervosa. Our treatments are still not good enough, and um, they're certainly worth doing, but I'm on a mission to make these better. The other thing that um, I guess it's just sort of the uh, consequence of being interested in peer teasing about changing the environment is uh, prevention work. And we do this in various ways. And I'm just uh, featuring our media smart work. I'll get Simon Wilkes to stand up and wave. Thank you, Simon. Simon's very much driving this work now. Um, so he's very much in the, in the driver's seat here. Um, this is work that we use in schools and that has shown good long-term uh, protection against increases in weight and shape concern over two and a half years with young people. We also now have an online uh, version of this with young women who have body image problems and also have some symptoms of an eating disorder to help them to start to, to deal with that. And... Um, we deal with a lot of topics. We particularly focused on the images that people are seeing in the media, these thin images that have been talked about, uh, these particular ideas about how people should look. And a major emphasis of this work is how to stand up to pressure from others. Pressure's about how you should look, pressure's about who you should be, and um, how can you actually embrace who you are yourself and stand up to these pressures. And the last slide here just really is uh, showing that this approach is looking very promising. And I'll just walk you through quickly here. Basically, if it's um, the longer the uh, blue or the longer the uh, red line is, that means our media smart package is outperforming the control or the other 
uh, online approach that we compared to and doing it significantly in a lot of cases. So in other words, it's helping decrease disordered eating, decrease the clinical impairment associated with that, decreasing feelings of ineffectiveness, negative affect, and improving psychological quality of life. So this sort of brings my career to full circle from being a clinical psychologist to research and now feeling that we're actually making a difference in people's lives. So that's why we like being academics. <laughs> How great was this? Are you having a good time? Yes. Having a great time? Yes. Um, now, we're, we're going to sort of be turning over to you shortly. So what I'll ask is we've got two wonderful colleagues with microphones, which is ter terribly exciting. So if you have questions, we're going to get to them in a second. I'm going to ask the first one. Is that okay? And then you can take over. Is that all right? Now, my first question actually is, is about you and about them. Who in the room is wearing a Fitbit or an eye watch? There it is. Karen, we've got the same one. Isn't that exciting? Uh, so I just was going to ask the panel about how digitisation impacts on the issues we've been talking about today. So we think about what we call the self-monitored fitness movement, so the self-monitored fitness movement, so the Fitbit, the iWatch. So how do you consider and frame the digital interventions in the body image discussion that we've had tonight? Because there's been some analogue issues and some media image and media representation. How is digitisation intervening in this story? Who'd like to start us? Well, you know, I, it's um, one of my notes um, had about the Fitbits um, to try and mention this because I saw something uh, quite sad actually last week at my daughter's netball game. Uh, an eight-year-old, uh, her mum was taking her Fitbit from her um, and she had a huge tantrum and she was in tears because she didn't want to get onto the netball court without her Fitbit. So I think I'll, I'll hand it over to you for the part two of the conversation. But I just know um, as a mum, I just found, re I found that really sad um, that 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 young girl, that eight-year-old, couldn't go out and just enjoy a game of netball without considering her actions on the court. Uh, all right. Um, back in the 1990s, I, I did a, a master's degree and I remember the heart rate monitors were just coming in. And in a former life, I used to be an elite-level triathlete. So I used to do the Iron, Hawaii Ironman, Japan Ironman. I've done a lot of Ironman races and races around Australia. And my supervisor at the time, um, he, uh, he, he said to me, we are now living in a technocratic rationality. And that, that ideology has stuck with me um, up until now, right up until now. He was a very good 400 metre runner himself. Um, and he said, we should not be training in that way. We should be training on our feel. We should be all of those sorts of things, you know. Um, Part of me says yes. Now, I'm also the director of the SHAPE Research Centre, which is sport, health, activity, performance and exercise. So we actually test elite athletes and young athletes who are aspiring to be elite athletes. We do a whole range of different physiological testing, VO2 max testing. We do um, BMIs. We do skin folds. We do all of those sorts of things because they are the benchmark around which we have to, um, I guess, identify where these athletes are and that's where they want them and their coaches want them. And yet there's part of me saying we shouldn't be doing this because we know that, that this could be affecting people um, with body image concerns and so forth. So we actually say to, to, to young but not just girls, we do say a lot to girls, but also to boys, if you don't want to have your BMI done or you don't want to have your, um, uh, your uh, skin folds taken, you don't have to, much to the um, displeasure of coaches. But that whole te technocratic rationality has now moved from sport from, and from elite level sport to, um, to mainstream. Mm. And that's, that's one of the problems. And we get caught up in it. We get caught up in the 10,000 steps. And, and there's, this, there's this ideology that you have to have 10,000 steps. And you know what? I've got a Garmin and I just had a look at how many steps I, I, I did. And, you know. and it was, it's really quite interesting. Not that it's going to affect my day, because, but, it, but it has the capacity to affect 
some people's day as a result. And how many people in here look for the 10,000 steps, just as a matter of interest? Just put up your hand. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm not saying that's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm just saying that we are, are caught up in the mix of it. And I think, can I just add to that, when I do Mount Lofty, um, I see all these people get to the top of Mount Lofty and they're checking their watches. Yeah. And I, and I want to stop some of them to say, oh, look at the view. Yes. Check at the view, not this. So yeah. I, think, I think with, you know, all of our approaches to positive body image and interventions and, and these, you know, Fitbits, for example, I think it's a case of balance. Mm. I get it for elite athletes, but I think it's infiltrated into the eight-year-old netballer um, and everyone who seems to be doing lofty. Um, and I think there's a real disconnect mm. But if I, if I may just jump in, though, in terms of um, there was a story going around um, a number of years ago when we had the AIS cycling here, we still do, but there was a coach that there was a, a girl who was breaking records left, right and centre um, and she was, in terms of BMI, she was almost <coughs> obese and yet she was on a bike and she was breaking records on the velodrome left, right and centre, as I said. Um, and yet her coach um, required her to get down her BMI down to a certain level and her body fat percentage down to a certain level. And when she did, she stopped breaking records. And she left the sport. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it, it, that's, a, that's a sad thing about... So, so we go back to that comment that was made by my master supervisor in terms of the technocratic rationality. We, sometimes we need to train by the way we feel not so much, uh, uh, you know, against the clock and against, uh, against the, um, uh, the digitisation. Okay, I'll, I'll just make a brief comment. Um, I have. Oh. Oh. Joshua? Yeah. Um, just a brief comment, and that is that all of these things are, are tools, and, of course, it's a question of how they are used. Um, people can use them quite well. But what we have when we have that sort of technological thing is the opportunity for people to invest too heavily in them. So as some people used to have their day determined by what they weighed on the scale, one can do the same by what your Fitbit says or, or what you've done. And so um, these things give people the opportunity to do that. But, of course, you can use them wisely also. Good or ill. Fantastic. So I, I'm done. We have a call oh, now. We have a question at the front. I will ask for colleagues to wait till the wonderful microphone comes your way, and we have the great pleasure of watching our great women organising us wandering round this room. So I'm going to gain great excitement as you do. But are so, they wearing a Fitbit? That's great. She is. And so then we'll go to the back later and get that question. Thank you, my love. Uh, thank you. This actually, uh, it's not a question, but it's a comment and just bringing something up for discussion when we're talking about things like these Fitbits. Um, I think uh, we, we should be really mindful that this is actually a, um, a product of capitalism and just another thing that should be sold. And so that's really the place that it has. It's not about fitness. Um, per se, it's about dollars. And that just that I just think we should be mindful of that because, you know, saying walking for 20 minutes a day is just as effective, if not, because really that thing on your wrist has got nothing to do with fitness. It's about a company making a lot of money out of your insecurity. That just throwing opinion out there. As many of these products, I think, are... And I think when we become aware of that, how we're manipulated by um, marketing and the media, and a lot of these things really, um, that's what they are. And, and that's what a lot of body image is, is making people feel insecure about who they are. And that's very, very easy to do, I think. And welcome to Adelaide, of course. The first question involves capitalism. Respect. Uh, now, um, would you, could we have, could we, I mean, respect, that's fantastic. Like, the commodification of fitness, you rule. Um, anyone on the panel like to offer a commentary, comrade, about that? Other than we agree. Other than we agree? Respect. So, next question. We're, we had a wonderful lass at the front, so we get to see you wandering around this room once more. So, this is truly tremendous. That was a good outfit to select to be moving around the room like this. That's great. Great shoe choices. Wonderful lass at the front. Yeah. Great. You love your shoes. Hmm? I, I love her shoes. Not my shoes. Her shoes. <laughs> thank you. Um, and thank you to all the speakers for speaking. So, I've 
just gotten into my fitness journey, like restarted. So I'm going to be a bit of a devil's advocate. Um, so my question is just um, about so the Fitbit thing and talking about the different gadgets. I have my Garmin, which I take everywhere. And my journey started, well, journey of getting back into fitness started with the Prime Minister's One Million Steps when I realized that I was only walking an average of 800 steps because I work in an office job. So most of it was just go, going back and forth between the car or going to grab lunch or something, which was usually takeout. So this has really helped me to, um, to just improve my health and you know keep track of where I am with my fitness and stuff. So my question is, is the issue fitspiration or social media or is it just the comparison aspect? So it's not that Fitbits are evil or that social media is evil, but it's just when you start comparing your health peak to your health, to someone else's health peak, that's when all the issues start to come up. Very powerful. Tracy? Okay, um, I'll just start and then hand, I think Marika will have something to say about um, I guess working from a gene environment interaction perspective, I agree, and I think it's already been said that uh, there is no no good or bad. Nothing's good or bad. It's how people use it, and um, some people are just more inclined to become obsessional, or particularly around numbers, or perhaps comparison that involves numbers. Uh, but we know that our client group starts to believe that the number on the scales equates with their worth as as a person. And, but we also know that they genetically are disposed to being a bit more obsessional, a bit more anxious. So um, I think if you're one of those people for whom it becomes a trap, then, then it becomes a problem and you need to act on that. But for others, it won't become a problem. Uh, yes, I think Taryn said this before. Everybody does it how they, they see fit. Um, and there is no good, bad by definition, except that I would say that I think that comparison is evil. As far as I can see in all the research we do, um, nearly all of the bad things are mediated by the amount of social comparison people do. Comparing to images, comparing with peers uh, in social media, for example, comparing numbers of likes. Um, and so if we were able to do a magic bullet thing, the one that I would choose is the, the comparison one. I think that really is problematic. And of course, it's problematic in many contexts and some different contexts make it more or less likely and our advertising and so on is designed to make it, us do it. Um, yeah. Um, it, interestingly, uh, as humans, we are competitive beasts. That's what we do. Um, sports started out... Um, people just playing around, you know, with a rock covered in, you know, a skin and that people kicking that around. Then all of a sudden they had teams and then they had to make goals and they had to um, you know, try and beat each other and compare it. And then how many people kick goals and who kicked the most goals and all of those sorts of things. So we, we like to compare. That's, that's how sport um, sort of came about. And that's why rules, rules were made and so forth. Um, so what you're saying, there's some important things that you're saying because you probably didn't know how many steps you were doing and then all of a sudden you found out how many steps you were doing and then there's also the medical guidelines that have been identified in terms of how many steps we should be doing a day and then you can start to compare that against the medical guidelines and and so that's a really really good thing so it's exactly what um, Marika and Tracy are saying here it gets to the point where when we compare and contrast to the point where it's healthy is great. It's when you compare and contrast to the point where you obsess and it controls your life, that's when it, it becomes concerning. And that's a whole, and that, that's just, you know, that's really important for us to understand as humans. Um, but unfortunately, some people have obsessive natures and they compare and contrast too much. So it's, it's how, do we, how do we work with that and how do we understand that? Yeah. Mm. Um, I just wanted to ask with your body image movement, how you balance the message in terms of, okay, yes, your body's beautiful and, you know, like all that good stuff but maybe don't have McDonald's for breakfast every day. Do you know what I mean? Like where the health message is also um, added into that. <clears throat> so, yes, I get this question a lot. And 
I am an advocate for eating foods that make you feel good and have lots of energy and moving your body for pleasure and not punishment. And we've taken a group of um, 2,000 women through um, a, a course that we put together with some professionals last year. And we're finding the data is showing us that they're now moving their bodies more, that they embrace their bodies because you can't look after something that you don't love. So we're finding that the embrace message is actually inspiring people to move in, in a joyous way. Um, and this year, this eating McDonald's and my kids all the time, they, they because of the consumerism and, you know, the marketing and, you know, McDonald's and their toys and they want to eat McDonald's. Mum, can we have some McDonald's? Um, and all I can do at this stage, because they're 12, 11 and 9, is just check in with them and say, we have it occasionally. Um, but I often ask them, like, how do you feel now that you've eaten, you know, the McChicken and the fries and the sundae? And they often say to me, oh, it doesn't feel great. And I say, well, maybe just remind yourself of ne that next time you go, I've seen McDonald's and I want McDonald's. You know, I think we as human beings, we have this, um, we have intuition, we have these internal guidance systems. No one knows our bodies like we know our bodies. And I, I think if we can reconnect people with, with their bodies and the way that their bodies move and more about how their bodies feel, I think that's going to make great health, mental and physical. Thank you very much. Question down the front, if we can. If we can wait, wait for the microphone. Oh, well done, you. <laughs> Fantastic. See, she's so relieved she's not humiliated in front of the audience. So My I, love. I, so I'm just sort of interested in the transition from ch uh, child to adult. I've got a daughter diagnosed at 17 with, we just caught her on it with eating disorder. She wasn't serious, but we caught her in time. And we, we got through that with family-based therapy and... Um, and then we moved into the body image, which she's still getting help with. Um, and only last week, I've made three years, you see, I've just turned off Instagram. Um, it's such a transition because while she was a child under 18, we could go to the, the sessions with a psychologist and work through it with her. 18, she turned and, you know, mum and dad just keeps paying the bill and we can't get any feedback. So just, and you ask a question she doesn't want to talk about. So it's just that, that transition from... No, a minor to an adult, how you deal with that, living at home, doing uni and stuff like that. So it's just, it's really hard because you want to help, but uh, uh, yeah, that's an issue I'm dealing with at the moment and I just want your thoughts on it. Yeah, your, your help and support is still important, even if you can't be in the therapy room. Uh, a lot of work that we do with parents whose kids are now over 18 is about equipping parents with skills to live with it in the home in a way that doesn't destroy you and, and helps the person. And so it's still incredibly important that, um, that you're there to, to, yep. to support her at home and to be able to have those conversations when she's open to having them. There's also something to be said for the fact that she's got to get to a point at some point doing it on her own. You know, So it's really tricky, that balance. And unfortunately, 18 is not some sort of magical... Oh, so this means you don't need parents. You know, it's it's just some sort of rough shorthand in society and, and that's how the services go. So um, I, there is certainly um, a move in this state and it's the policy of the current government to integrate the child and adolescent and the adult eating disorder services so we can overcome that artificial divide and actually provide the best service at, for what the person needs regardless of the age. So, but please know that you're still really important. Yeah, yeah. I understand that. I mean, she just, she just keeps telling me, oh, you don't understand. And I say, well, give me something to help me understand, you know. Yeah, yeah. unfortunately, um, and... family never understand. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't matter, yeah. you know, <laughs> who, who the family is and how great they yeah. are. Give me, you know, that's, what you're reading that, yeah, that, that I can read. So, that's, yeah. that's the thing. Mm. Um, but if, if you, um, we do run the family skills training um, regularly. So if you do get an opportunity, I would really recommend that because it helps you to um, stand back but not go crazy. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that question with us. That was wonderful. Uh, we'll go to the one, two, three if we can. Right at, right at the back if we can. Sorry about that. Oh, Dylan, right at the back if we can. One, two, one, two, three. Thank you. Good evening. How are you? I'm good, thanks. 
I just wondered what you guys feel the influence of the clean eating movement has had all, on all of this and the sort of obsession with purity in food. Um. <laughs> I, might, I might just pick that up because um, the idea of purity food not eating has been around for a long time. We, um, one of my case presentations is about St Catherine of Siena who was a very bright woman um, in the 1300s, but she starved herself to death by the time she was 31. And at that point, this idea of not eating was about purity, was about um, giving yourself to God and being an acceptable sacrifice. So I think the clean eating movement hasn't got any new ideas. It's just recycled sainthood um, coming around again. <laughs> and it's just incredible how how um, eager we are to accept this idea um, that somehow what we put into our bodies makes us better as a person. Thank you. The next question, the, the lovely lass in front of the pillar. Hi. Good evening. Good evening. Um, my question is about BMI. Um, I was very interested in the comment that the gentleman made about the, uh, the female sports person who was told that she needed to lose weight because she was considered obese um, because of her BMI. Now, I'm not an expert, but I believe that the BMI data was made many, 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 many years ago and statistics show that as a society, as a whole, we're... Uh, our body shapes and our lifestyles and everything are contributing to us all being a lot different <laughs> than we were when those original BMI uh, benchmarks were put in place. Do you think that they need to be looked at again? Because um, I know that um, I have experience with a family member who, who suffered from anorexia nervosa and I know that they do um, very much focus on that BMI and, um, you know, fitting into where, you know, underweight, healthy weight. Do you think, basically my question is, do you think that the BMI is still relevant today? Um, yes and no. Uh, there's an argument to be made, in fact, Tara and I were talking about this before, um, about the significance of, of BMI. It's an indicator. It's for a general population. And as I said before, we... As, as humans, we need general indicators. Some have argued that the BMI were originally put in place for insurance agencies. Um, quote, I don't know if I can quote that or not. But <laughs> some might argue. I didn't say it was me, myself. Um, so there is, there is that argument that, that has been put in place. Look, we, we are, as a population, we're growing. I mean, secular trends show that we're growing, on average, a centimetre every... 10 years um, as a population, um, we're, we're getting bigger, we're getting stronger, um, our nutrition's better, we're, be getting, we're, we're becoming more muscular, which also adds to the BMI because it, 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 that adds to the weight, which is heavier than fat, those sorts of things. And you'll actually find that some of the elite level athletes do, um, you know, morph over into the, um, into the, the higher levels of the, of the BMI. So yes, it can be, it is antiquated. But it is a figure that we as a, a, a population have become used to and, and it is a form of standardisation. But that's it. And we need to be educated that, 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 that if we are muscular, if we are tall, if we are strong, if we're powerful, that it may not be the, you know, we may not have to fit into that category. So, yes, I agree. And last question. Oh, I'm so sorry. We have last question at the front. Thank you. We'll organise it later for you, I promise. My love. Thanks very much, everybody. <laughs> um, I'd like to ask Tracy a question. Um, fascinating uh, research that you're doing and a number of points you brought up, which I think would be really interesting to hear a little bit more about. With regards to your work with nature and nurture in terms of the genetic difference with the partic two particular eating disorders that you have found with anorexia and bulimia, uh, and when we're talking about the, the genetics, the actual genetics part of it, I'm not sure whether you touched also into obesity and that affecting the same kind of genetic differences affecting that. 
um, with regards to the food that is consumed and how it operates in the stomach with regards to that genetic difference, such as the spleen breaking down and handling the sugar in a different way. Um, if I just like a comment from you or to see like in terms of like where that research is going, um, could diets that specifically, because you, I, as you would know, and I, I'm not sure if other people would know, a lot of people uh, theoreticise now that in fact the gut is the second brain. And in, in terms of like keep leaving aside the nurture part of it and, ha and what kind of psychological um, impact might affect people's eating disorders later in life. But sorry, this is a long question, but how do you think that um, given your research is so intense that prescribed diet in terms of like the kind of foods that were eaten, eaten and how they affect the spleen and the endocrine system, processing that food could be a guidance to people with eating disorders? Tracy. Yeah. Um, I... I guess I'll just make a few basic points first. One is that genes and environment are about 50-50 with this. Uh, it's a little bit higher with obesity. We think about 70% genetic. So um, um, the genes that are involved in body mass index can either obviously go for overweight or underweight. So I think a lot of things are interrelated is sort of the first general point. Um, we're only at the start of the journey of understanding the metabolic issues that might influence eating disorders. And so things like what's happening in the gut, uh, what's happening in the spleen, um, these are things that we're hoping we can examine those biological pathways and start to make sense of them. Not, I think, perhaps so much to guide diet, uh, perhaps exactly, but um, perhaps and I'm just making this up, we don't know, but perhaps there's a role for probiotic use or there's some sort of supplement that, that could, be, could be used. So it's really um, trying to, to get that, that bigger picture and to come up with some novel pathways that are worth targeting. So an example of this is that, and this is not in eating disorders, but for anxiety, we know that an antibiotic um, that's used for... Um, tuberculosis actually helps with people with anxiety to expose themselves to the thing that makes them anxious and to get better a bit more quickly. So if we can start to understand that these complex interrelationships, what we're hoping to find are some perhaps some novel approaches that will, that will be adjuncts to treatment. I don't think we're going to find a magic bullet that will suddenly be the cure-all. Alluding to, um, have you discovered an interaction between the consumption of types of food and the brain chemistry with regards to the function of the person's psychological state, with their motivation? Yeah, um, the quick answer to that would be no. Uh, the slightly longer answer would be that um, what what we are picking up is that diet and uh, restricting diet and losing weight is an important trigger, environmental trigger for switching genes on and off. And when that happens, whether it's in a famine or because of an eating disorder, then those genetic changes can get handed down to children um, as well. So the, the food we eat has a, a big impact on the way our genes work. Thank you, Tracy. There's no doubt that we could probably keep going with questions for several hours, nay, days. But I have a few jobs at the end to conclude and just be with me for a little while if you can. Can we firstly thank Taryn for being here? I, I also need to thank my incredible professorial colleagues at Flinders University. Haven't they been fascinating? So Murray, Tracy and Marika, can we please thank them? Fascinating research. Truly world-leading research, and it is a privilege to work with them every day. And of course, my other thank you is to all of you. There's something really empowering and extraordinary about a group of people coming together on a relatively cold Adelaide night to explore ideas. The public intellectual is a very rare beast around the world, and perhaps even rarer in Australia.
And it's wonderful to have so many great public intellectuals here to share and think and create and transform. So I thank you for your presence today. Flinders University is proud of the alumni that are in this room as well. We are terribly proud of you and thank you for your support endlessly for this great institution. And I've always wanted to do this. As I declare our evening close this evening, I'd like to welcome you to Light Refreshments. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, a good evening. Thank you.